find ships like these. Nowhere but on the five great inland seas of America. Ships of unique design, high bow and pilot house forward. Then the long cargo space, 300, 400, 500 feet. Then the after deck house, long ships with honest working lines and a beauty all their own. These are special ships designed for special cargoes or for a nation's steel mills, coal for its boilers, limestone for its blast furnaces, oil for its gears and motors, grain for the bread of its people. These cargoes are the lifeblood of the nation and all through the season, April through November, the long ships carry them. Down from Duluth through Whitefish Bay, up from Chicago and through the Sioux, filing in an endless procession through the St. Clair Flats. On across Lake Erie to Buffalo, these cargoes move, and the story behind them, like no other in the world, is that of the long ships passing. Before you can understand the long ships, you must understand the lakes they sail on superior to the north, the largest, deepest, coldest of the lakes, an inland ocean rimmed with bleak headlands. To the south, Lake Michigan, framed by great cities like Chicago. Blue, expansive Huron and her quiet islands. Then eastward, long, rolling Erie, the shallow lake, quickest to rouse in a storm. Cold Ontario, gateway to the sea, and eastward from Ontario, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the broad highway to the Atlantic that makes the shoreline of the five great lakes a new American seacoast. All this began in the early 1800s, when a young nation was starting to grow. Its ability to grow, however, depended on how much steel could be poured into its bloodstream. The resources were there, iron ore and limestone to the north and west. On the lower lakes, coal fields and markets. The resources were there, but to make use of them, to tie them together, a gigantic low-cost transportation system was needed. There were two great barriers to such a system. To the north, at Sault Ste. Marie, a stretch of rapids carried Superior's overflow 22 feet down to the level of Lake Huron. This was bypassed through construction of a lock. Today, five great locks raise and lower ships between Lakes Huron and Superior. A second barrier was between Erie and Ontario, the Falls of Niagara. This was bypassed by the Welland Ship Canal with its eight locks. A giant marine staircase enabling ships to climb and descend 327 feet from one lake to the other, the largest drop of any lock system in the world. Finally, linking this lake system with the shipping lanes of the world is the St. Lawrence Seaway. And around these lakes, the heartland of America, the industrial strength of the nation is concentrated. Strength that flowed from its lake-borne commerce. Sustained by a fleet of more than 700 ships, some of which, in the course of the season, may sail the equivalent of three times around the world. The story of the long ship's passing begins each season when the first thaws of spring break the grip of winter. For months in ice-locked harbors around the lakes, 
the ships have hibernated in their winter moorings. Now, as the days grow longer and the ice begins to break up, advance parties of crewmen begin reporting aboard ship all up and down the lakes. Fitting out time is here. Meanwhile, up north on Michigan, Huron, and Superior, weaknesses are appearing in the ice. And the Coast Guard icebreaker Mackinac is finding them, breaking her way through, opening channels through the acres of ice. Built especially for this service, the Mackinac is one of the world's most powerful icebreakers and the pride of the Coast Guard Lakes fleet. Slowly, like a dragonfly, her helicopter comes in with scouting reports covering hundreds of square miles of lake channels. The Mackinac pushes on. Further south, on the lower lakes, where much of the water is already open, there are other signs of spring. Lighthouses are readied. Aids to navigation are set out in a kind of nautical spring planting. In the mooring basins, the ships are getting up steam in preparation for the word everyone is waiting for. And then it happens. One ship from one of the fleets becomes the first to lock through the Sioux. trumpet goes ringing out. The lakes are open. From Duluth to Buffalo, the lakes are open, and the freighters are moving. Out of slips and mooring basins, down rivers, out past break walls and harbor lights, and on to their upbound and downbound courses, the season is on. For the next eight or nine months, shipping lanes and channels of the five Great Lakes will be alive with a never-ending stream of traffic. Now through the countryside, long trains roll northward, loaded with coal from the coal mines of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and West Virginia. And when they reach their destination, a long ship awaits them hungry for cargo after a long winter's emptiness. A loaded car, one of hundreds in the yards, rolls slowly toward the big coal dumper. It is locked to the rails, carried upward in a super elevator. At the top, the car is tipped and the coal flows smoothly into the gigantic funnel which lays it carefully in the hold. The ship backs from its moorings under the coal dumper. She rides low on the water, 10,000 tons of coal in her belly, and becomes part of the vast pattern of movement all across the lakes. Her destination, one of the great power plants of the Midwest, where low-cost transportation is an important savings. To the north and northwest stand the big grain elevators with their golden horde of America's prairies and this too is carried by the long ships. Ships on the scale of the prairies themselves, capable of carrying a yield of 30,000 acres in their holds, or more than 45 square miles of wheat land. In another port, a self-unloader discharges their cargo of limestone. These are unusual ships, able to unload themselves wherever they can navigate, Docks aren't essential. If a ship can pull to within 40 or 50 feet of shore, she can swing out her boom to unload. You will never mistake this type of ship for another. Outward bound with her long boom secured on deck, her profile is distinctive. Now that the season is open, 
all up and down the lakes the ships are moving. Stand on almost any shore and you'll see one on an average of every 17 minutes in the summer months. Look in almost any direction out on the lakes and you'll see them. Ore carriers, self unloaders, crane ships, oil tankers, auto carriers, cement carriers, vessels for both lakes and ocean. Fishy back carriers for packaged freight. And passenger vessels. And standing by to render aid, wherever and however necessary, the trim line vessels of the Coast Guard, maintaining vigilance along 4,000 miles of Great Lakes shoreline. Here is vigilance of another type. Whistle talk. A sound on the lakes old as steamboating itself. A language of 450 different signals that runs the gamut from hello to SOS. Inside the pilot house, a more modern language is spoken. That of radio telephone. Talk between ships and from ship to shore. There is the accurate language of the radio direction finder. The sure, voiceless language of radar. All of them together spelling out the most important language of all, safety. A language that makes these five great lakes the safest shipping lanes in the world. Maintaining them are the dredges operated under the direction of the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Channels must not only be kept open, they must be deepened. For deeper channels mean bigger cargoes and more economical transportation. The addition of a single inch of water to the Great Lakes channels increases the annual tonnage the ships can carry by a million and a half tons. And so it is that the season passes, spring through summer through fall. And the ships pass too, upbound and downbound. All day and through the night, taking dawns in their stride pushing on past sunsets, arriving in ports at all hours around the clock, unloading one cargo, taking on another. And of all the cargoes carried on these five great lakes, the greatest is this, iron ore. Iron ore for the steel mills of America. Almost half of the lake's trade is in this raw material alone. As much as 95 million tons of it, 8,000 shiploads have been carried in a single year, compared with the next largest product, coal, at 60 million tons. Iron ore is the mother of the Great Lakes fleets. Without it, the long ships might never have been born. So the ore carrier is the true symbol of the five Great Lakes. If you would go behind the Great Lakes scene, you would begin with a long ship leaving some lower lakes port, upbound and empty. Her destination, head of the lakes, and one of the big iron ore ports of Lake Superior. If she's upbound from Lake Erie, then a very important event occurs in the Detroit River, meeting the mail boat. This mail boat, along with the post office at Sault Ste. Marie, serves all the vessels on the lakes. Leaving the Detroit River, a ship moves into Lake St. Clair. 
through the St. Clair River into Lake Huron, then 300 miles north to the Sioux. Sioux St. Marie, once an Indian post on the Sioux Rapids, today the home of five great locks. Lake Superior lies 22 feet above Lake Huron. Therefore, these locks act as elevators, raising and lowering ships from one level to the other. Let's watch now as an upbound ship approaches the lock. The water is let out to the lower level. The lower gates open. The ship enters the lock. The gate closes behind it and the ship is sealed in a chamber filled with water. A valve is then opened and the water flows in until its level reaches that of the water in Superior. Then the upper gate opens and the ship proceeds on upstream. Now let's actually go through. The lock we are approaching is being emptied. When it reaches our level, the ship moves into it. It takes from eight to 10 minutes to empty a lock, 10 or 13 minutes to fill it. An average of 90 ships pass through these locks daily, although the record has gone to 176. As for annual tonnage, that passing through the Sioux in the limited season equals the combined 12 month tonnage of the Panama and Suez canals. We're through the locks now. Beyond lies Lake Superior. Meanwhile, as the ship moves north and westward, a long line of freight cars loaded with ore moves down from the mines toward the loading docks. And even as the ore arrives, the long ship approaches Duluth Superior Harbor. And the loading dock, where other vessels are taking on cargo noses slowly up to the dock. The first cars of ore roll out to meet her. Time now to begin loading. Up on the dock, the chutes are lowered. Ore, the equivalent of more than 220 car loads, plunges down into the hungry hold. When you multiply this one ship by a constantly moving parade of ships throughout a season, the result is a system so efficient that it can haul a ton of ore from Head of Lakes to Cleveland for about the price of a carton of cigarettes. At the same time, to the northeast, another ship is arriving to take on a new type of cargo, pellets from taconite ore concentrated to high-grade feed for blast furnaces. One of the new products of modern beneficiation, taconite pellets have become an important supplement to our iron ore supply. Back at Duluth Superior, the ore carrier is loaded, only a few hours from the time she pulled in under the ore loading rigs. And while she's in, cargo of another nature is taken aboard. On deck, the crew goes about its work of securing hatches and cleaning up. There's little time to lose. As soon as the last hatch cover is tight, the ship will be on her way. Aft and below in the engine room, the steam pressure is being checked. Up forward, the officers gather in the pilot house. A moment later, the mate on watch calls in, Ready to shove off, Skipper. The captain rings down the engine room, slow astern. The signal is received, executed. Propeller shaft turns, and the long ship backs slowly away from the dock.
Now, another signal. Slow ahead. Receive below. Executed. And in response, the long ship moves slowly forward. Behind is the fading harbor line of Duluth Superior. Up ahead, the famed aerial bridge. And out beyond that, spreading wide to the horizon, Lake Superior in a downbound course 820 miles to the unloading docks. In the chart room, the mate lays out the first leg of the downbound course. This is one of a network of prescribed courses, covering all the lakes and observed by all captains. These courses are a remarkable marine highway system designed for one purpose, safety. On the radio telephone, the captain reports his departure. This is the Shenango 2nd, WL3108, clear to loop. Uh, steer uh, 63. Course 63 degrees. The wheelsman sets his wheel on automatic gyro. This device, used on many ships, will hold the ship on course out in the open lake. first mate takes over in the pilot house. Into the log book go the routine entries, time of departure, tonnage carried, course followed, all the important facts that together make up the history of a vessel. The big ship and her 20,000 tons of ore are underway, the vast wash of Lake Superior rolling out behind her. Life aboard ship is divided into watches, Four hours on, eight hours off, round the clock. While these men keep things shipshape on deck, aft in the engine room, the men keep the mighty heart beating. In the galley, work of another kind is in progress. How important? Well, ask any sailor and he'll tell you that a good steward's department goes a long way toward making a happy ship. And the food here? Well, it has a far-flung reputation. Varied, well-cooked, plenty of it. Envied by sailors the world over. During the four hours you're on watch, you're helping run the ship. But during your eight hours off, you're your own boss. Life is as pleasant and relaxed as you want to live it. Cruise quarters are trim and comfortable. Mates and engineers combine office and cabin space. Recreation rooms are complete with television, games, a ship's library. There is plenty of time for hobbies. And if you want to study for promotion, there are textbooks and winter classes sponsored by the Lake Carriers Association. Study or work may be interrupted by lifeboat drill, but this is standard practice, part of each vessel's safety program. Meanwhile, the ship moves on along its course, down through the lake with the haunting landmark names. The Apostle Islands, Thunder Bay, Keweenaw, Caribou Island, Coppermine Point, Whitefish Bay. down at last into the St. Mary's River. Picking up the white range markers on the river and then swinging in toward the locks at the Sioux. And some 30 minutes later, the last gates open and beyond lies the lower St. Mary's River. The Sioux is behind us now. Ahead, the broad curve of the river our ship becomes part of its pattern of traffic. The banks of the river move past. Gradually, the river begins widening as we pass a Coast Guard station. 
At last, we're approaching detour light, and Upper Lake Huron lies ahead. If you're downbound to Lake Erie, you steer left at this point. If your destination is Lake Michigan, then the wheelsman bears right as you pass detour light. And you head through the Straits of Mackinac, under the soaring, breathtaking span of the Straits Bridge. Finally, you swing south into the great long sea of Lake Michigan. The end of the run is here, under the massive hewlets of the unloading dock, where the hungry monsters scoop up 20 tons of ore at a bite. And so it goes, April through November, a train of long ships passing, unloading and loading the cargoes that keep America alive. Until one day the run ends for each ship. Somewhere in some harbor along the lakes, the snow is blowing. Ice is making in the quiet bays along shorelines. Time now to lay up, to put the faithful long ships to bed for the winter. Time for the crews to go home and be with their families through the winter months until another season begins and lakes are open again. And when they are, the long ships will move once more across them. Others will join them. The big new hulls already in the shipyards getting ready for their first taste of water. Long ships, rugged, powerful, majestic. ships with a proud tradition, for through their low-cost hauling of bulk materials, they have helped to build a nation. There are no ships like them anywhere in the world.